for joining us at, for another Puka J Productions podcast. It is March the 17th, 2017. My name is Ben. I'm one of your hosts and I am coming to you from Northern California, up here where I live. And I'm Luke and uh, I'm in Southern California and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Indeed. Cheers. We are Puka J Productions. Uh, you may have seen some of our stuff on uh, YouTube or uh, Facebook uh, in the past. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you if you like us, please like and subscribe uh, on the YouTube buttons there. Uh, we are going to start, we've been doing a couple of podcasts. I think this is podcast number three, but we're going to start doing these a little more regularly. We've got a new little setup here. Um, and uh, we've got some interesting things to talk to you about today, particularly uh, concerning the Great Pyramid. Yep, it's a... Uh... You know, it's one of the most famous sites in the world, and it's, you know, very well documented, but um, just in our last couple of trips there, we found a few things that uh, aren't so documented. I've certainly right. not seen much mention of them anywhere, and two things in particular, and um, we're going to share those with you today, and hopefully yeah. it'll be a little bit of uh, a reveal for you. Yeah, a little bit of mystery in um, some of the places that a lot of people get to see. Um, so the other thing that I, I wanted to do with these podcasts is to, when it's appropriate, review some of the news and the, the things that are happening in the space. Um, again, if you followed our work uh, or, or anything like that, I guess if you're, you're interested in the same fields that we are, which is ancient civilizations, um, looking at uh, what all of the new scientific work and evidence that, that, that is coming up continually um, and how that affects our view of the past. There's you know, continual work that happens, none of these sciences stand still, be them history, archaeology, um, but also geology and, and, and paleoclimatology, all of these things, they, they all do come together to change a picture of the past. Yeah, we're, we're definitely reaching a point too where it's uh, starting to be a little bit okay to question our, our timeline. There's more and more stuff uh, coming out. Every six months there's a, a new study which uh, shows that you know our understanding of history is limited at best, and right. uh, it's it's actually kind of encouraging. You know? Yeah, yeah. There is there's lots to be discovered. So let's review just a couple of things before we get into um, the Egypt topic today. Uh, so let me change over my screens here. So this is our kind of our, our the new setup, kind of how we'll work through it. Mostly it's going to be footage and stuff that's in our editing programs. You can see Luke's on the screen. I'm there, and then. I've actually got another camera um, pointing sort of at the back of my head, if you like, that's, that's looking at the studio uh, down the here. the man bun cam. The man bun cam. Yes, we're lacking the straw hat camera today, although yeah. I'm sure it'll make an appearance. Um, so a couple things to, to touch on, and they both, they both relate to the Younger Dryas uh, event, the Younger Dryas boundary. So we did, we've done a video on the Younger Dryas. Um, it's going to be over here. So there'll be a link on YouTube. You can click that to watch uh, our video on the Younger Dryas. It's, a, it's an excerpt from one of our earlier podcasts. But if you're familiar with Graham Hancock's new work, if you're at all familiar with Randall Carlson, you'll know what that is. But you know, in summary, it was this tremendous event that happened 12,800 years ago where it looks basically almost a locked solid case now that a comet uh, skipped across the Northern Hemisphere and sort of devastated the Earth ended the last ice age, raised all the sea levels, flooded the world, set half the world on fire and ushered in like a thousand year deep freeze that effectively ruined the day for um, all of the species on earth. It killed all the megafauna, the big stuff. It, it probably drove the humanity to the brink of uh, extinction. Um, yeah, it was quite the event. So these bits of news kind of related to uh, the Younger Dryas. Yep. Uh, a few years ago, it was the, it was the Nano Diamonds. Uh, you know, and the, the dye sheet that they were using, and, and now they found platinum, right? Yeah, they have actually. So we'll get to the platinum, the, the platinum stuff first. There is um, uh, recently a discovery uh, by uh, some archaeologists working out of South Carolina who do lots of good work that uh, this event happened, right? There's some acknowledgement that, that around 12,800 years ago something happened. Um, we don't really know what, although there's certainly as parts of the scientific community that have a very good idea and will tell you that it was a comet. There's lots of lots of scientific peer-reviewed papers that are backing that up, and this is yet another one. It 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 basically states that there's been a widespread discovery of platinum found across the the North American continent, and you can see here the sites where they found this. Um, platinum is a very rare element, uh, at least on Earth. It doesn't really ex it's very hard to find, uh, and in this case, you know it's it's quite common though when it's a, it's a very good sign for cosmic impacts. It's a common element that's found in asteroids and things that hit the hit the Earth. And in this case, there was there's a layer of it that spread across. It's consistent with 12,800 years ago, meaning that something hit the Earth 
big enough and hard enough to put a layer of fine platinum dust in the air that fell to the ground and now has been you know, compressed into the strata such that it's been dug up and dated to 12,800 years ago means a comet hit the ground. And it, it's that magic number that uh, just crops up. Yeah, time and know, time again. Geologically, time and time again. And, yeah. and there we are. And that's the end of the Clovis culture, right? So that humans have been here for at least 200,000 years, according to the fossil record, possibly quite longer. Uh, this was an event that would have driven us to the brink of extinction. And, you know, it's kind of funny that all of recorded history happens after that date, right? 12,800 years ago, that's pre any civilization as we know it. And there's no wonder why, right? This was a, yeah. a serious end of life event. And just to give you an idea of how catastrophic this was, this is another little problem that got solved, another piece of news and another paper, scientific paper, but something that I find to be just really interesting and it's a very good, um, a, a very good way of sort of showing this. But, f but, but let me... Uh, let me talk a little bit about um, what 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 it means. It's it's a it's a paper from Antonio Zamora. It's uh, the first thing to come out on the Carolina Bays in in about twenty years, and it's it's a real doozy. It's there's a there's a there's a there's an area of the Carolinas here. You can see this is the the coast of um, of uh, eastern coast of the United States. This is North Carolina, and if you look in this area, it's sort of easily seen here with with Google Earth there's all of these little circular depressions, right? These are Carolina, these are called the Carolina Bays. They're lakes and they're farmlands and they're just, it's, you know, it's all areas that have been farmed and used over thousands of years. But these things exist and there's always been some controversy around how they, how they occur. And you can see they're all over the place. They really, they're up, they're down. But they all seem to be oriented in one direction, right? That there is, uh, it's, it's very consistent with ballistic impacts like the, and this is in fact a technique that the paper used to prove what happened here this this is it's, it's not uh, this is not a res direct result of the comet hitting the ground this is actually the result of chunks of ice this is the secondary impact this is the splash damage from a comet you see these are lined up they line up at the great lakes region which was the runoff from the laurentide ice sheet that covered all of north america and canada the comet hit that so hard that it ejected chunks of ice that must have been a mile or two because some of these lakes are, 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 are two or three miles long. Uh, it ejected chunks of ice into the atmosphere on a ballistic trajectory from up there in, in, in uh, the, the ice sheet that took eight minutes and they landed in North Carolina and they formed these bays. Like this has now been determined by the scientific paper staggering to think about really. i mean the size of an impact where you know something hits you know high up north canada and just sort of <laughs> ejects mile long two mile long chunks of ice into the atmosphere crazy for yeah. you know traveling for what eight ten minutes something and then coming it's eight down minutes yeah in in carolina and they looked at like one of the thing the questions they asked on this was how come the ice didn't break up in the atmosphere? It's because it actually most of the ice was hit so hard it went into the upper atmosphere. It was suborbital, but it was a ballistic trajectory. So it popped out of the atmosphere, flew over, and then popped back down, and then as it came back down, likely broke up a bit. But this is the splash damage from just what the fallout from this comet impact that happened. So it just, I mean, there's you can talk a lot about the the devastation that that's it's, just, it's more that corroborating evidence it's really like yeah. we're just going to keep seeing more and more this you know yeah exactly yes we are so as for our current purposes the earth is really you know 12,800 years old that's really what's going pretty much. on it this, was this the server got rebooted it was remade that's right yeah it was a serious reboot and it's the biggest thing again to have happened in five million years and it's given our species amnesia as graham hancock likes to say and it's yeah. i think it's I think there's entirely possible that, that an ancient civilization, a high technology civilization existed, not of aliens or anything like that, but humans. And, and the remnants of that civilization is, is what you see in a lot of these places today. Yeah, multiple, multiple civilizations. I think we're looking at, you know, much like it is today. Indeed. Know? So let's transition over to Egypt. And just as a way to get us started, I've got a nice little sort of intro reel of, of, a, of some footage that I'm working on. So you can see here, we're going to sort of make that a little bigger so we can make the video a little bigger. Uh, but this is a nice little intro reel, just so it's it's something that I, I hope would encourage people to go to Egypt. It's right now, in the last five to 10 years is, is like a time that hasn't happened in Egypt for 50 plus years where you can go there. And there is really hardly anyone there. You can 
you can you can get into yeah. these sites. You don't have to wade through a sea. I think of their numbers are finally starting to pick back up a little bit, but it's still still a good time to go. Yeah. yeah. So let's run. Always this always go go now. Don't yeah. don't put it off. It's exactly. Like yeah, it's, it's worth going. Baby crying that time. No, oh, there it is. Did you? Yeah, just just for a second. This is my favorite show. One of my favorite shots from our uh, last trip. Yeah, that pan across the front of the pyramids is amazing. This is Sarah PM, uh, one of our our best videos yet. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's on our channel. It's a it's a great uh, interview with Yusuf. Yeah, what a cool Sarah place PM. that is. I I gotta say. Cool it's in the red ways. pyramid. Yeah, there was no one here, and yeah, yeah, there was literally no one there that day at all. I was dying on that day. You were <laughs> very ill. Yeah, Abu Sia. We will be talking much more about Abu Sia and Abu Ghraib. Yeah, two two amazing. Well, it's all really part of the the same site, but yeah, uh, yeah we're that we need to spend like at least an hour on on those places yeah. just by themselves. This is the valley temple in front of the, what they call the Sphinx a temple as well. Again, this is one of the oldest structures on Earth. It's so megalithic, and yeah. it's uh, so much older than uh, than we think. Yeah, and this is so the Great Pyramid. This is really what we're going to focus on today, talking about um, sort of the things you could see and a couple of the little mysteries that are tucked away um, that you might notice when you go in there. But just for people that aren't 100% familiar with it, what you'll see here is the, the sort of the front face of it, um, what looks like a doorway or entrance up high with the blocks, the angular blocks, uh, isn't. It's I guess it's technically is an entrance, but it's it's filled up with these massive granite plugs, um, and you can see a little hole that's sort of south of that, a little down. That's uh, that's Mahmud's hole. That's the hole that was sort of cut into the limestone blocks around the granite, and uh, as luck would have it, turned left eventually and made the um, made the connection with the descending passageway that also was then the junction it hit the they hit the junction between all the passageways it's kind of a lucky a lucky strike Very to get lucky, in there. Yeah. yeah it's kind of interesting don't press play just yet before you uh, before you go on I also want to point out that you see these uh, like the fence pylons in the in the, the front of this uh, yeah. picture here and I just want to point out that the the blocks underneath that are some of the largest blocks on this site, they actually go down about two and a half feet, maybe a little little more into the ground. Some of them are 20, 30 feet long, mm -hmm. 20, 30 feet across. These things are absolutely, absolutely massive. Like how they move that stuff. And and again, when you see the joins between oh, them, yeah, you you can't fit anything between. It, it's it, it's unbelievable. Yeah, in fact, that's a very good point. And we have a lot of footage of the pyramid and around the outsides and people sit yeah. on stuff and they walk on stuff. But look down when you're walking all of the Giza Plateau and a lot of this yeah. area is, as Luke said, yeah. massive blocks. And you'll find what's strange about this is not only do you have massive big blocks, you also have tiny little blocks that are, that are like squared, small pieces that, but that, mm -hmm. that must be, you know, you would fill it up with, unless you really wanted that to be super. So there's no need to carve that and have it so precisely match its neighbors that you have to put in one little piece right i mean you'd fill it with sand or something else some other building material the one other thing about these blocks is that they also match the ground underneath them they're level surface but they've been carved to fit uh yeah. with the the bedrock um this is you know one of the things we see with the the ancient builder possibly pre-cataclysmic yeah. cultures is that they have a way of, of working with stone that is just you know truly brilliant yeah i, th I think about it as, as they had just mastery of of the environment they had an organic technology that let them yeah. like that you know you don't need to build we build technology and structures from steel and composite materials because they're easy to work with and you get strength and lightweight but if you have absolute mastery of your environment and you have organic technology where it makes it easy to, to mm -hmm. work with stone you don't need to build you don't need to create steel you, your material is right there you just make things massive <laughs> And you know, look, look at how long these things last. Yeah, last you know, without long. without taking care of it, a steel skyscraper isn't really yeah. going to last very long. Exactly. So yes, yeah, this is as you approach the front, it just gets massive and massive. <laughs> it's even bigger when you get up close to it. It's quite insane how big this thing is. Every time I go, yeah. so this is the staircase you follow up, um, and then this is the entrance to Mahmud's hole. You can see these are the massive limestone blocks that they tunneled into. 
This is yeah. also the area where they remove all your fancy camera equipment. Yeah. And yeah all uh, our footage uh, inside is is sneakily uh, cell phone uh, footage. Yeah. Um, you will Just get tackled, uh, as you... I have been in the past. Me also. Yep. Had a guy take my stuff away in the Valley of the Kings and I did recover my stuff but it wasn't yeah. without a small scuffle. Right about where I'm standing there in this, this video the, the first time I went in 2015 In uh, your hat no less. Yeah, in my straw hat. I, I got uh, physically like, you know, this guy jumped on me and grabbed my camera and I had no idea what was going on. He had no ID he had nothing identifying himself as you know someone who worked on site and there was this, just this guy oh. screaming at me trying to rip this camera out of my hand and it Fortunately, uh, Yusuf and uh, Muhammad Ibrahim were there to kind of interface and, you know. Soothe was, everyone. I was, yeah, I was prepared to defend myself. And my yeah, get away from my camera, it's mine. Indeed. So, yeah, as you walk in, this is then the junction. They're the granite plugs. Um, that's a descending passageway down to the subterranean chamber. Right. This is now in the Grand Gallery walking up there. There's a couple interesting things about the, um, the Grand Gallery. Yeah, you should remember when you look at this stuff, uh, as we like to point out, that you know we put those stairs in. This is not a, a space that uh, was easy to move around in uh, yeah, right. by any means at any time. But you will see these you know, really interesting things cut into the sides right. uh, and, and under the walls. Yeah. Yeah, so as you're going up, you'll see these... these uh, there's some a couple of interesting features. As Luke was saying, the staircase wasn't here originally. It's quite a steep area, but cut at regular joints into the wall are these alcoves and then they have individual pieces of stone kind of vertically inserted down into them and they and it and they actually go down a fair way yusuf was telling us um so that's quite i mean this isn't a big mystery this but it is a mystery nobody really knows what these were for uh you have to it screams some sort of functional purpose right so something was moving up and down and these are cogs or something like that but you have to then Maybe you have to then sort of assume there was a functional purpose for the whole place, and then you know it's. I'm not sure that we have uh, the right answers here yet, but that's 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 a real mystery that um, that kind of exists there now. Let me well, every, everything up, about you know the the pyramid is, um, you know, it's 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 very purposeful. Yeah. You know, the, I, this whole thing just screams function. Yeah. And you know, this isn't. This isn't an artistic, you know, representation, you know, of of something. This is uh, this is built for a reason. Must this be. is built for a reason, yeah. Yeah. So one yeah. other thing to note to the Grand Gallery, which is just an awe-inspiring space when you're in there. I mean, the beveled ceiling is insane. And if you look down, this is at the top, looking down, uh, at the top, right up there in the top edge, at the top sort of corner of the back wall. If you think about the same space behind where the shot is, that's the entrance. Where they dynamite it in to get into what they call the uh, relieving chambers. That's the, that's the space where all the controversy happened around the, the German guys that grabbed a little chunk of the hieroglyph or whatever and have been a couple, couple thoroughly little flakes persecuted of, by uh, of, it's, you know people. red red paint that yeah. uh, in my opinion was was put Added. there by Howard Weiss. You know, mm. but uh, right. it's it's one of the really super super weak pieces of evidence that they use to, to you know attribute this pyramid to, to Khufu. Right. You know, the the other being the like three inch high statue, statue that they found Khufu. in a in a pit, you know, by the Sphinx Temple. Right. Um, Which... So between that and this this red, you know, ochre paint on that relieving chamber, which is the only thing Howard Weiss found on that trip which he needed desperately needed funding for mm. uh, you know that's what they use and the really interesting thing if you look in that cartouche that they took a flake of that that paint I don't see many people mention this but the the K hieroglyph is usually a circle with like five lines across it you know right. left to right or right to left and in that cartouche it's a circle with like I think it has like two and maybe one, maybe a third faded line, and it doesn't look, doesn't even look like a good K. Right. You know, it it looks like somebody doing a bad hieroglyph. There's job. a lot of, there's some weirdness around all that. There's definitely some controversy around that. I can couldn't imagine it's proof one way or the other. Um, it's yeah, it, that's there's just a lot of, yeah. I want to use, I don't know what word to use. <laughs> well, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, what we're looking at here too, we should we should mention all of these pyramids. The, the old ones have these granite cores 
Yes. And you know, really quickly, they're they're made up of really large blocks. Some of them are you know a couple hundred tons. Mm -hmm. And as we know, as Egyptologists love to point out, but they don't like to talk about this part. But you know, the ancient Egyptians weren't able to cut granite or shape granite. When you quarry granite, especially those big, 160, 200 ton, you know, single pieces, you have to cut into the center of the quarry, and you've yep. got to go down sometimes nine, 11 meters. Mm -hmm. To and get then to, solid to get to a solid piece that isn't fissured or cracked in some way. That's right. And so then you've you got to extract extract that 160, 200 ton granite Up block of... that you have somehow cut with your copper chisels and your dolomite right. pounding, pounding stones. stones. And, and you, you pulled this thing out and dragged it down to the river and you got to get it up on a barge and wait for the river to come and float this and take it all, you know, 900 kilometers up, up to Cairo. And then lift and it up. And of course, yeah. and then lift it up and then put it in exact position and all the rest of it. And of course, you know, they didn't have the tools uh, as far as what we found to do this. So the Egyptologists like to say that all of these granite pieces were just found. Lying the Egyptians around. found them lying around, already cut. Yep. So they were just able to take these and, and you know, a little, little little dollarite pounding here and a little dollarite pounding here and, mm, and you're good to go. <laughs> and yeah, you know, it's, it's what's really interesting is that a lot of these not just these three pyramids but like Winesis pyramid and mm -hmm. you know a bunch of the other supposedly fifth dynasty pyramids they all have these granite cores with passages and chambers right. and you know, there's something really going on there you know from a, a culture that didn't have the tools to to create that stuff. Yeah, and it's just it's it's illogical. If you can't attribute quarrying to the old kingdom, then how can you can attribute any of this other achievement? It's it's you know, and this is the other thing. These these you got to these yeah. sites are so nuanced. I mean, in a lot of cases, these granite cores are freestanding inside the pyramids. It's the case right. in the Great Pyramid and Macaris Pyramid. They call them relieving chambers, but they're supposed to relieve the pressure of the pyramid sitting on them. But in both cases, they don't touch the actual. It's a freestanding yeah. structure inside the pyramid. It was as if it was there before and. Somebody built a pyramid around it. Um, it's quite clear it's in little, Menkara because you yeah. can you can get down into that chamber right where they've got the gate. You can just you can l look through there, right. and you can see the top of that relieving chamber just not touching not touching anything. You used to be able to go through there and lie on the top of that. Yeah. So but, as so. we go a little further into the pyramid here, so turn around to the top of the of the grand gallery is is a passageway that that goes underneath. Uh, towards the king's chamber and there inside that passageway you've got a couple of sort of vertical spaces where you can stand up um, and these are basically like we call them sonic resonance chambers they, they have a very very acoustically active uh, they're the orthodox opinion of them is their portcullis system they're, but and in fact there were blocks of there were big blocks of granite that had to be removed from these spaces it's quite possible that they were that's maybe what they use for but they also have some really awesome uh, acoustic properties and this is all there on the map and everything there's yeah. one little aspect of this little passageway, though, that, that it isn't on anyone's diagrams. And it's a little strange little thing we've been trying to get to the bottom of for a little while. Uh, Luke, more than me, I know he's been, he's been looking at this door and wondering uh, what is behind it and where it goes for, for a while. In fact, people have been wondering for probably 30 years. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we've we've put a gate in there. There's some cables going through. Uh, we've, you know, we've padlocked it, but nobody seems to really want to talk about this. Uh, Yusuf himself, uh, you know, his father pretty much had access everywhere, anywhere he wanted to go, he would be let in, I'd imagine. And Yusuf's never been able to get in there. Uh, Stephen Mailer did say that he'd been. Is it looks? It, you can almost tell here. It's easier to tell in per person, but. Uh, mm. You know, it turns to the left there, and then it kind of cuts back around to the right, and it looks like there's a, a little staircase or something going up. And Stephen Mailer did sort of confirm that there was a little passageway that went up and around the yeah. corner and then seemed to stop or something. I don't, I don't know. But uh, apart from him, I haven't, haven't spoken to anybody else who's been in there. And I've looked on an awful lot of schematics and diagrams, and the closest I've seen to any notation of this is a small black square on a diagram that would have been right where this door is but there's no real real mention of this and i was curious enough that when we uh had that when we went to that debate in 2015 oh, so-called debate between <laughs> yeah. uh graham hancock and and Zahi, dear zahi yeah. that um you know there's a q a period at the end and this is one of the things that i asked zahi about you know what is this door where does it go you know what's that all about and right. for whatever reason 
he denied any knowledge of this door. He kept saying that I was talking about the stone portcullises that were removed. And when I kept asking him, he just went and sat down and had some guy called Ahmed come out and tell me the same thing, that it was these stone portcullises and I must be mistaken. And yeah, yet, you know, silly. Me? Here is this here is this iron gate. Yeah. And what's clearly a block and a passageway that goes around and up. And that's, you know, it's, it's yeah, we're not saying it's a, it, this definitely is leans to the you know the the star chamber whatever it it this it we just, it's just an unknown like this is a right. passage it's a space it seems to go somewhere uh, it's very difficult to get answers out of the people that have the keys to the damn padlock um, and you know there's people that like Yusuf that have been living in this site for his entire life and never have has ever been back there even his father who has you know obviously hadn't told him what was back there. Um, it's just a mystery. It's it's a real unknown um, uh, about what's behind that door. It's just one of the questions. It's not really the reveal that we're looking at here. This is actually something inside the king's chamber that is just pretty astonishing, yeah. and and that we haven't ever seen any footage of or anyone really talk about. But you know, we we sort of found it and managed to get some film of it. So this may be the first time this is kind of shown on film. We'll see. Yeah. Before we we get through there, I think Ben's going to say, you know, grab your headphones, right? Yeah. Like grab that. the headphones. You know, these chambers are so resonant, and um, it's really hard to pick this stuff up, like on a phone, uh, microphone. Uh, but we, you know, you can still kind of hear how powerful, like, this, this yeah. resonance is. Particularly in these chambers. Um, but let, I'll just let Yusuf talk about it. We stand up, and, and you'll hear some of the standing waves. And just for people that haven't experienced it, it's... Um, a standing wave of a sonic resonance chamber. You, you, if somebody hits the right tone that generates them in the right wavelength, that then reflects back perfectly uh, to you. It's it's as if the, the sound is coming from everywhere. It's and it's it, like, yeah, it creates this intense this vibration. Warm, warm. You can you can you can really it. start to feel it in your and, chest. Uh, yeah. Yep. And when when we're in some of the satellite buildings around the Great Pyramid uh, in 2015, I. I recorded i measured some of the sounds and they, they seem to be a low f sharp yeah but i think you know obviously depending on what shape room you're in but that's, that's the right. other thing is that you know the, the egyptians were really all about the cubit and uh all of these rooms are on that scale know, yeah on the cubit scale so and yeah. a lot of them are you know are half the width is half of the length and you know it's it all seems very precise like it's not random at all Right. It's not like we put this thing together and there was just these random shapes that happened to form cavities, you know. Yeah, right. And then, right, we'll, actually Yusuf will mention a little bit of, a, a little bit about that and we can talk a bit in a minute. Yeah, but right. you get a bit of... No, oh, this is your favorite part right here. Yeah. <laughs> don't know why. There it is. There you go. Wow. This is what's labeled as a resonance valve by uh, Dr. Christopher Valve. I'm not sure he's a doctor, but... I'm not, I'm not sure either. He's a learned man. That's for sure. He, he really is. Uh, he's great with uh, tools and measurements. And Cannot be just a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, machine, right. Uh, machine workings. Oh, he's, yeah. He's a powder comb, then check it out. They put the barrier on the inside. Right. Yeah. And then they moved, and then there used to be uh, wheels or like, what? Yeah, and I think uh, they, they the came up with that the, wheel theory because it's like the semi-circular, the like mm, some of those something niches. Something. But it has a turn. They didn't, they didn't have, the, they didn't have you know, levers and wheels back when the Great Pyramid was made. So what are they putting? Ropes and wheels in there how are they doing that the, the idea is that that it's a pulley system where you've got wooden pulleys and ropes that are lifting what must have been a 10 or 12 ton granite block up right sure okay right. how many guys yeah, are going to line up in there to yank on that rope i don't care how many yeah. pulleys you've got and in, all in this space that's compressed into the space above here and that's also what Yusuf's saying these are what are the if it's slid up and down why are there these channels on the wall you don't need these channels to slide I mean, right. unless it's for ropes or something but these are the things that actually cause yeah. standing waves um, yeah, there's you know there's a ceiling in outside the the second pyramid in the the you know excavated uh, rock wall. You know there's a lot of doors, and yep. uh, most of them are blocked off or filled with with rocks. Uh, one of them has an iron door, sort of like that. Uh, you know, you has got a small hole in it. You can stick your hand with your phone through there, and, mm. and 
and I, you know, I did that. And if you look at the ceiling in there, it's got these okay, same understand. kind of grooves cut into the ceiling light that I've you got know, that here somewhere. Why you know why are you doing that? There's 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 a purpose you know for that somewhere along the line, and uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's that's right. the thing. I, I think there really is a function for almost everything you see, like an actual right. physical function. You know, the, the Egyptians were also, uh, you know, very spiritual, and they had a very clear and much deeper uh, understanding and belief system. Mm -hmm. You know, when it came when it comes to other dimensions and the afterlife and the, the function, mm -hmm. the cosmos, just how everything works and, and where everything comes from. What you know, they weren't. Still, we're still sitting here. Scientists are still sitting around going, "Well, there, there could be a soul. We're not. There's something that well, we can't really see." You know, for the Egyptians, for a lot of these ancient cultures, it wasn't a question. You know, they knew yeah. absolutely that we're, a, you know, some kind of a, an energy or a, a spiritual soul being having a human experience. Right. And you know, we're still our culture, which is you know, we're the pinnacle. Right. We, we, are, we, yeah. we still haven't figured any of this, this stuff out. That, that's, that, yeah. I, look, I, I think that I agree that you, these things scream functionality. And certainly the Serapium, if you watch that video we did, it, it's it's quite obvious that this must have, you don't do precision work like that unless it has a, pur a functional purpose. However, I, I hesitate to, to project our form of technology, like you say, mm -hmm. onto it. We have a very electronic, mechanical orientation in our technology right now i think ultimately it leads to organic technology i mean that's just where it goes but it's it's we you know it's okay to to say i don't know that's what's lacking in our um evaluations of these sites because we refuse to let ourselves think that we aren't the pinnacle of human technology in existence i do liken these things particularly the serapium but also the great pyramid it's 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 about the same thing as it could be about the same thing as showing a like a, a battery dead iPhone to a frog, right? It's a shiny square box that I that I jump on. That's all it is. Wow. Yeah. But it's so much more than that. You just have to know how to, to look at it. And we just that frog has no clue as to what any of that stuff means. We could be the frog in this situation, and it's okay to think that. I mean, well, we are, have we're so limited just, in terms of what we can see, yeah. you know, in the spectrum, what we can hear. I mean, even compared to other animals, you know, that exist here, we're very limited in yeah. like what what we perceive, and it's quite possible that you know, I mean, it's it's like two hundred years ago. That's where science comes. You know, from. imagine like all these Wi-Fi signals going on while yeah, we're sure. like running around on horse trip. Like we just wouldn't be aware of it. Wouldn't be. Aware and I think of there's it. a yeah. lot of this kind of stuff that it, it maybe functions. You know, in a dimensional space that we're just not really aware of. We, we haven't figured out, right? And that's that's what science is doing, and that's why I like I'm I, I love that, and and that's also why science is different to belief. Like there's a there's a real there was a real little nugget there because some people liken science to a belief system, but at its core, it's not. It's a it's a it's a method, right? It's a method for evaluating the world around you and providing evidence and supporting stuff. That's why I love it when they do these scans. They're doing more work in the pyramid. They're looking at it with infrared. They're looking at it in spectrums we can't see. They're trying to see is there other clues that lead us to in some direction. And like you say, we just, I mean, there is, it's one of the, I was writing, I was working on this pod, not this podcast, but a presentation, like a lecture of this this stuff. And one of the things you can, you realize is that there's an eerie coincidence or, or some sort of um, um, alignment between some of the really cutting edge parts of science when you think about string theory and that's which is actually admittedly like interdimensional there's you know you sort of it almost lines up with the things shamans have been saying for for in our culture for thousands of years and, and like you say entire civilizations have focused on yeah. the same thing when you look at we talk about harmonics and vibrations it's an interesting area of science because in on both on the quantum level um that 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 that, that is a whole ball of wax that's being unraveled but also there's there's it's an emergent area of science looking at how, how vibration and sounds can actually affect the physical environment so you know it's, maybe it's a path that leads you to a thing that says oh you can levitate stone with this or you can change you know controlling yeah. gravity we don't even un we barely understand gravity we've just sort of discovered gravity waves like there's as you say we're, we're just we're just infants in some of these spaces so it's okay to look at things like this and say i don't know <laughs> And that's, yeah. what I, that's where I end up with it. I don't know. Yeah. I, it doesn't yeah. prove much, but I can tell you if it was functional, then we don't understand what that, what, 
how it was functional, what it did, and it's because we haven't got there yet. Yeah, and, you know, and there's a lot of interesting, uh, you know, ideas and thoughts out there. There's people who believe the, they're water pumps. There's people who believe that they're energy harvesting machines. There's people like Ben Earth Carson regulators. Who, who believe that uh, grain was stored there by Joseph. Oh, okay. The Bible. Yeah, ben Carson. You know, there's there's all kinds of. Uh, theories out there and you know some of them have a lot of merit not ben carson's <laughs> very easy to but to still you know i think i think the first step really is is you know being okay with not knowing right. and uh you know these things weren't tombs and that's for sure yeah. you know you watch listen to one of our i mean i don't uh, i'm not going to waste time again it's so easy to destroy the tomb theory it's right. uh, shouldn't even shouldn't even be mentioned anymore to be honest right. Right. but this looks like what can also be functional as uh, vibration, sound results. I mean, yeah, in there you can barely, just barely, barely, and it just dominates everything. So when you, you come out of that little passageway, now you're into the King's Chamber, which is just an astonishing granite room. Uh, uh, Geometric, sacred geometry, so many things represented here. It's alignment, the building of it, the preciseness of it. It's um, an astonishing achievement. Um, yeah. Yeah, it has uh, shafts in the wall that we'll see here. Does. That, yeah, that's uh, the entrance way. The, you know, align with certain constellations. They, they bend off. Part of the years. Oh. I found ancient water bottles. And unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm making fun of it there, but it's it's yeah, sad on a couple levels. Uh, you know, one of them is that that it, people think it's okay to just dump their trash in there, which, as I was saying earlier, I think is is a, a whipping offense as far Pretty as much. I'm concerned. Yeah, but also that it's been left there. I mean, I imagine at some point they'll go. And clean it's actually it quite a ways in. It's like it's it is. it's deceptively long, and it's like probably ten feet or something. You have no, to get it's a little little, somebody tried to like get their water bottle back that far. It's uh, yeah, it's yeah. It's it's part of the experience these yeah. days. Like I, we we explored uh, the catacombs underneath uh, Winnie's pyramid yeah. to the side of Winnie's pyramid. And it's an absolutely amazing place. But the getting down in there, like the first twenty knee feet, deep. you're <laughs> you're knee deep in like plastic bags. That I mean, Rubbish. I believe it's like the wind. It's just sort of caught it, and it goes into these like it's caught in these staircases and crevices and. I don't think they're actively dumping stuff in there, but literally, I mean, you're, you've oh, got it's everywhere. 20 feet of, of wading through plastic that it, comes up over your knees. It really used to, it, you know, it used to be worse. It's still pretty bad. Um, and I mean, you know, at least anything that's a hole in the ground, whether it's dug a million years ago or not, it gets filled in yeah. with trash eventually. It's just sad. It's actually the case in a lot of these countries that don't yeah. know how to deal with the trash. But it'd be crawled into a, a Mastaba. Uh, actually, that was the day that oh, they had dying. to. And yeah, it, that was fun. I was face it, full, first face it, first into that place. Yeah, it took about 15 minutes to, to clear the garbage out of the tunnel so we could crawl in. Get in there, yeah. Thanks, guys. That was, they earned their extra few bucks that day. Definitely. So some interesting things here as you, as you, as you kind of um, walk into the Great Pyramid. And yeah, this is something that I'd noticed before, and Yusuf points it out here too, but like these, these stones at the back have all been taken out in back place at some point and yeah. just for, yeah keep that freeze for frozen for a second you can see in the top right that what looks like a stone there on the ground there the bends yeah he's that looks like a stone it's the same color it's almost looks like it's the same texture you're in there without a flashlight there's a bunch of people like you don't have time to really examine stuff like it used to especially it used to be moved in and out so quickly because there are lines and lines of people waiting to get in and you, you're not allowed to take cameras in there. You're not allowed to have this equipment. But if you go in there and you look around, you start to notice that some of this stuff has been replaced. Mm. And they've cemented this stuff in. And obviously, the original builders aren't using cement. And when you get back and you look at this stone in that corner, what you find is it's not a stone. No. They've got this fan or box, Thing. which is not connected to anything. anything. And underneath it is... Is this metal plate, uh, which has a hole, which has a hole in it, which covers and, a cavity under yeah. there. Yeah, and there's a space under there, and it's really hard. You know, we got our phones up there and the flashlight up there, and we had a look, and you can see it goes down about three, three and a half feet yeah, in we'll depth. So there's definitely, in a definitely room 
to uh, to move around. So again, it's looking in as you walk into the king's chamber. You've got the the machines and the back walls there, and this is the right hand side here. And you can see these. You can clearly see when you see it, like the floor's been messed with. Um, and these these machines are not connected to anything. The fan that's in the the, the shaft on the left also is is anything. you know I think that might be connected to something. But it these ones are not. These ones don't do anything. And uh, they're just there to cover this up at the moment. So yeah, we'll skip forward a little bit here. We'll yeah, I guess you thing. don't want anybody going and saying, "Hey, there's a hole over here." What the hell? Oh, you know why? Know. So you know, again, this is something that you don't see on schematics. You don't see that there's a cavity underneath this room. I've um, tried to go searching and, and look I haven't it. seen anything about there being a hole here. I haven't seen anything about them oh, removing a stone. Any excavations in the great chamber? Like, where does this go? Does it go under those stones? That were removed on the right. Did they see that it went somewhere? So they removed those stones. When was was there something? Done? Was there something under there? What was taken out? When was this done? Who did it? Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, anybody who's jaded enough to sit there and go, "Oh, they removed a stone so they could put a plate, so they could plug in an air conditioner." You know, that's not. That's not how this. If you go into any of the other pyramids, you'll see that they run these cables like along the wall or yeah, something. Yeah, there's for conduit. You, and it's the same gonna, in this pyramid. There's, a, there's it runs along along the wall and conduit in the corner. You yeah, can see it. You're not you're not gonna dig. Uh, so you if know, you look in dig there, you out can blocks to so that's you can a, plug in an air conditioner. That's a that's piece a steel of steel girder. Yeah, it's angle iron. It's um piece of it's holding up the plate. But what there's a couple of other interesting things here. It's a space, right? There's clearly some crap and trash down, there, which is not unusual. And we've done this a bit. We've excavated this out, or we've removed the boxes. It's something I think either we've done, or at least I don't know if the hole was here. It's just there's no data. I've, I try, if people out there have information on this, please let us know. Uh, I'd love to hear yep. any answers. The other thing that's interesting to me is, as you sort of pan around, like you get it, it's crappy footage, but that's what we have now. Um, yeah. Uh, the We're walls, not na the... National Geographic, sadly. We haven't <laughs> no. made, we haven't paid yeah, just our, tourists, our just special tourists. Zahi Hawass fee. Just tourists. Retainer to have access. Only to amateur our... tourists. And, uh... <laughs> Fancy can. Yeah, so the walls down here aren't like, if you go to the bottom of the Red Pyramid, where they have been, like, if you go right down into there, into the guts of it, and at the bottom of the chamber, uh, at the top, there's, they've tried to dig down, and they've dug, and it's, we don't leave nice excavations and walls that kind of look like this i'm just i don't know if this is the blocks if this is the facing um blocks like if this is the surface of facing blocks is this have we dynamited or dug this out where has this come from um but you'll see kind of look at the walls as we get a few flashes of it and we can pause but it's basically a space that we it could go anywhere it may not go, go nowhere but there's no data on this and this is in the in the king's chamber no one really knows this is here and i'm not sure there's any footage of this and hole I, out there. I swear i i would swear that that steel plate has been specifically made to look like stone sure yeah i yeah. honestly i honestly believe that it really nah, looks it like has. stone yeah 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 it's a crazy little uh it is a strange little um little thing it's it's just it's just a mystery that's right there in the in, in our face. Um, and, and again, I, whether this happened in the current administration, the last 20 years, it, I suspect it did. Um, whether it was dug out or what's happened, I mean, yeah, yeah. Was, there's just no data on this. It's just questions. So if you get the is chance, is Hawass so. responsible for this? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Yeah, you gotta love that guy. Indeed. So there's one other. I don't believe radar. <laughs> Yeah, well, I yeah. We, Twenty years, I find nothing. I'm we like, find nothing. Yeah, no radar. And then the first guy that turns up with radar. Sound, how do you how do you not find anything? Thing with, with radar, right? What is this turkey you speak of? We, we were in right. the debate. In fact, we need to pull this these out and show these questions. All of the if you've seen the blow up of Zahi, we were in the crowd and, and in fact helped take the footage. Yeah. Um, and asked uh, some questions. Yes, and he's asked some questions. One of the questions was about Gobleki Tepe, and he just he basically didn't know what that was. Yeah, well, that was one of his big defenses for understand. how Egypt is not pre-cataclysmic, is not older than we think, because there are no well, older civilizations on Earth that ever did anything like this. It, if there were, show me. So then we're like, oh, so what about Gobleki Tepe? Yeah, Ten thousand five like, hundred years is, ago. Carbon. Yeah, what is this? Gebekli Tepe you speak of is it in Egypt yeah, <laughs> we're yeah, like yeah. what what right. are you you know how, do you, how are you the preeminent you know Egyptologist master of all archaeology and you don't not, know it about something that's know. happening like a thousand miles it's away it's not that far away than, it's just over there yeah. next to Greece it's not yeah. that far away <laughs> it's, 
Yeah, and it's and it's it, it as you say is the specific it it directly debunks their sole argument against the redating of the Sphinx in particular because that was it's all scientific. It's Robert Shock. I'm sure everyone knows about this, but they but he him and a cadre of geologists behind him more or less looked at the erosion on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure and said that shit only happened because of rainfall thousands of years of it you know when the only time that was it was actually in the rain out period after the damn comet hit the ground it's in this period right. about 12,800 to 10,600 years ago about there that's what probably caused the erosion on the walls of the sphinx which means <gasps> the sphinx was there before that now and the, it's it's not the only structure you look at that there's well, so water that, damage on so many of these old stri- like Winnie's yeah. pyramid like oh, a lot of this stuff like, was already there looks like there was oceans of water almost on it yeah, yeah all this stuff is there but the specific scientific dating that has been really done on the sphinx that's the that's i guess the grant the, the 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 crown jewel of that argument and the egyptologists dismissing the scientific geologists and all those guys with that said this can't be the case because if this was there were people around that could have built this in that time period then there would be other megalithic ruins in this time right. period therefore the sphinx can't be that old now and then shortly thereafter like in the 90s gobleki tepe gets dug up and dated exactly like that exactly what they said wasn't there buried it's a megalithic 12, site years ago buried 12 purposefully yeah. buried right carbon dated to at least 10,500 years old so it's it basically here's your proof and it's not even that far away and he's just like what is this Kablaki Tepe you speak of. And, come on, come and on, he had he had come the on, goal son. to say he said, I don't know what this place is, but but you must be mistaken. And there was another <laughs> Egyptologist present who actually um, had um, to stand um, up and correct him and say, No, actually it does exist. Actually it was dated to then. You yeah. know, and he just sat there with that, you know, look on his face like, you know, you're all alien loving, you yeah. know, morons. And but, shortly you know, after he, he said, I'm he, very tired, I'm leaving by <laughs> Yeah, he uh well, he didn't want to do it. I think you know he no, he'd, he'd taken the money the to do the uh, the debate. He didn't put any time. His presentation was not a debate. It didn't address any of the climate issues. It didn't address any of the uh, construction issues. Oh, it didn't, he didn't address do anything. anything. His entire you know oh, his entire debate was this. not a debate. It was just a presentation of of himself at yeah, the pyramids a, and other places with lots of famous people just, and then his story about how he saved the museum from looting the personally saved the museum personally from caught looting the robbers. having personally and, looted the museum in the past himself right and i mean if you if you if you look in smithsonian magazine online you find articles talking about how he was prosecuted and actually convicted and sentenced for laundering money through, through the, the gift shop of the museum and his path, a big part of his presentation was how he had created. He had this shop. beautiful idea, idea to create this gift shop. No, no one had ever idea. thought of putting a gift shop as a museum and forcing people to go through it. it apparently, but, came uh, from him. But yeah, it's just. But then I the mean, regime the changed, is, and they pardoned him basically. So yeah, he's yeah. he's back he's in, pretty much the uh, the back Teflon in, back uh, in business. The Teflon archaeologist. Over yes, there, but, but he's uh, not worthy of a lot of. Um, anyway. Let's say uh, one other thing here. <laughs> That's a nice little diversion. So oh, one no, other th- right. yeah. You're gonna love him. Yeah, we should do it. We could because I have all his recordings. In fact, I've got uh, a bunch of him talking in front of the Sphinx, just calling everyone idiots. Actually, was what he was doing. Called the whole audience idiots. It was interesting. Um, so yes, something else. If you read these books, you know you are stupid. I haven't read any of these books yeah, myself. Literally, just so I, you know. What I mean, right. You actually, can't make it up. I should get the pamphlet. I'm. One second, Lower, yeah. I can grab it. Do you want me to show? It's the yeah, yeah, sure. It's the Mark, uh, him and Mark Lane. Tell the story. Yeah, so um, they handed out this uh, this five page sheet, which you know has printed on it. Do not share or show anybody else. You know, under any given circumstance. So here we are. Yes. And it was yeah, it's basically this diatribe on um, Zahi you know, Haras and. Dr. Mark Lehner. Yeah, and how you know anybody who questions anything about the official timeline is basically just an alien Atlantis, you know, lover who yeah, it was it, brain. supposedly a direct um, rebuttal to. It starts off with writer John Anthony Weston, Boston yes, it's, University, it's Robert Shock, blah blah blah. Yeah, saying. it's basically they don't even call him Doctor Shock. So this, they just refer to him as Shock. In later on, and yeah. these, these actually they don't call Shock. Just, Writer and Boston University geologist. Yeah, he's not a doc. So, yeah, yeah. Western shock. But they, they, this was the funny thing. I don't know if you mentioned it, but this was slipped under our doors in the hotel. 
right. if it, at the night off. So they went away from the debate, hurriedly put this. I imagine it's probably an excerpt from part of his book or what he's doing with Mark Lehner. And, and, and all of us got these things shoved under our doors in the middle of the night. Like, it, you know. Yeah. It's and a, the other thing that they tried to days. do, they tried, you know, we... we took, about getting out of the country. You know, we had our DSLRs <laughs> and stuff, and uh, we set up to record the debate mm. between Hancock and Hawass. And that was one of the first things that caused an issue, was they were like, no, we don't want any cameras. Recording. We don't want any of this stuff recorded. And we're going to record it, and we'll give you all the recording... Yeah, right. The professional recording because they had professional sound guys in there and they did something they disconnected like i connected to the soundboard and they disconnected yeah. my microphone from the soundboard and yeah. we're still we're two years later and there's no sign of that video time of the new that, era thanks guys they, uh, yeah they promised us in fact you know, all we've, of we've the lectures asked several times recordings. they yeah. they won't give any of those recordings out that were supposed to be available uh, to the group so let me officially throw some shade on uh, time of a new era and whatever they call themselves now archaeological pass or something yeah, it's don't the same get, company don't get do sucked don't get sucked do into not. going on tours with them yeah do not yeah. i actually got an, a message uh through the, <laughs> through the uh, facebook page yeah uh from somebody who was in peru south america with them uh, oh, I've got. It was like, who was like, were you guys on the archaeological pass? And they're, you know, we're being screwed, and we're yeah, doing this class action it. lawsuit, and like, we're Good. not being taken to any of the sites, and they're telling us it's all our fault. And, and then they jacked us eight hundred dollars for an oh, airfare that should have cost a hundred bucks. Like, oh yeah, it's yeah, even that less than that. One of the first. I remember calculating. They made they made like seventy grand, like yeah. right there. They basically the, booked uh, everyone on a five a.m. flight that you could have booked yourself on through the airline for a hundred dollars, charged everyone eight hundred dollars, and this is like. And from a tour that was supposed to be 30 people, ended up being 60, 70 people. And they sculled everyone for um, like an 800% profit. And it was yeah. a last minute post, like, oh, here's an extra expense that we've had after you've already paid. And he's, we could, we yeah. should and could talk about uh, them that in length, but there's definitely some nefarious sort of predatory people yeah. out there. And like you, you sell a trip for, for five grand you know, or six grand. Yeah, well, and then, you know, the people who have the people, half the people who send the deposit in are told that that deposit isn't part of the total. That's an extra, yeah. but the other half are not right. So you got that kind of thing going on. Then when you get there, you discover that even though you've paid this five and a half grand or whatever, <laughs> you actually haven't paid for any entrance fees to any of the sites. Yeah, they got so here's another 450 else. bucks for entrance fees to the sites, which is like, I mean, I've gone on my own. I, I had actually just gone to most of the sites on my own. I know that they're actually really cheap most of them to get into. So where the fuck is this 450 bucks come from? And then that doesn't even cover like no. a lot of the really nice, you know, stuff, which is an yeah, extra yeah, and special entrances these. to the, all the tombs in yeah. the Valley of the Kings and yeah. things. So those guys, what they're doing is, and and then it's, you know when you're when you're like, what is this two a.m. flight that you're stuck on that really is this much, but you're charging yeah. us like like five hundred percent or something. Now, and a, then they brought out guys in suits to tell you that that was the most expensive flight. And actually, when you book a group flight, it's more expensive than booking individual flights. I mean, doors. just the lies that they came out with. I know somebody else who runs a tour company over there. I just had an interest. Yeah. I was like, uh, "How much is like, this?" He's like, "This sort of cost you less with a group." Yeah. He said, "This is this is a tour dirt, company that runs dirt cheap." So there's there's and and to be fair, there's a legitimate requirement for security in groups, and you will always yes. have that. The government makes them do that with tour groups. However, that is a known quantity cost, and there's no problem with having that built in. The, the issue that I had with them was the nickel and the bait and switch. It was a bait and switch exercise. You, they sold the tour on that there were going to be 35 people. And well, so yeah, basically that. you've got like what that you can fit 35 people in one coach. So you're going to all these sites with Graham Hancock. He's in the coach. He's got a microphone. Now you, get half you know, that. now there's, you show up and there's 70 people. There's two coaches, but there's still only one Graham Hancock. And they, and they, they told like, us oh, that no, we would actually get... get more time with him as a result of that somehow. Remember yes. that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. were all these things like how you, you're just, you know, you've just split him in half. Like you've just given us <laughs> half the time, you know, and you don't go through these sites like, with the two groups you're assigned uh, to a group and they split them up so there i mean there's literally no way you, you would have yeah. as much time with with graham hancock and i, yeah, I gotta yeah, say yeah, i'm just, not i don't get anything from the commit school guys but if you were gonna go on a tour with somebody go with go the with commit them school commit school because you get much better information uh, you get much better food you get much better accommodation everything and they'll you pick get you your up questions from the answered. you go with 
guides who can read hieroglyphs. Yeah. Um, you know, they want to take you to the sites that are hard to get to. They know both sides of the story. They know yeah. the orthodox stuff. They're trans Egyptologists, and they'll also give you the alternative expressions without. They'll leave it open to it. They're not guys that they're pushing an agenda, which yeah. is great. They'll tell. Here's the mystery. Here's the contradictions. Here's what they say about it. Here's what other people say about it. Here's what we've noticed because they've noticed a lot yeah. of interesting stuff. Yeah, so go with those guys. K H E M I T Chemetology dot com, I think it is, or look up yep. Chemet School on Facebook, you'll find them. They do run ex exceptional tours that are really well priced too. Um, you'll save money. So one last thing I'll say is if you're into the into the King's Chamber and you look at this box, there is there is Luke posted something on Facebook the other day talking about well there was some yeah. drill holes that appear to be jewel markings. That's not all there is on this box. You, if you get the right light, this is usually a pitch black room, but you get the right light, this is the back wall, you can see the flat surfaces. You can see where it's been precisely it manufactured some point. It's definitely a lid that, pass. that we think actually slid on rather than dropped into place. Yep, it, you can it, see the flat surfaces. And then actually on the back wall, and we'll do more on tool marks and power tool marks, this next shot that you'll see is a clear evidence of power tool markings. Yeah, this is so the, the rear just, rear side of the box. Yeah, facing the back wall, and then you can just look look at that. I mean, that is it's that is clearly a, a machining lip from where they'd yeah. finished that flat surface. And again, yeah. who knows when this was done or how long it is. This has come down through thousands of years of abuse and time and all sorts of things. But you still the the tool marks are still there. Like this, and this is not yeah. this is granite. This is not something that you're doing with with Bronze copper, copper chisel. That is not like a oh, dollarite okay. pounding stone yeah. mark. This is uh, this is some kind of ancient high technology. It is, and uh, and right this is there. that you know one of the things that that I think is good to point out is that we see ancient technology at a lot of these sites in Egypt. We see yeah, it, it uh, you know in Peru and other places. But I think it's also you know a sign. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of alternate people, like to you know think that this is all done by aliens and. I actually think a lot of this high high technology stuff. I know Muhammad Ibrahim. I think agrees with me on this too. Uh, I think I've heard him say this: is that that you know there's a lot of evidence as well of mistakes. You know, a lot of this stuff is not perfect. And I think if this was some kind of alien technology, like all the lines, all the cuts, all the marks, everything would be uniform and perfect. And, right. and that's not actually what we see. But there's a lot of stuff in the Cairo Museum. You got to spend some time in the Cairo Museum. Look at the unfinished box. You know, it's a Serapium-like box where they, you know, they cut the lid off the bottom. Uh, the whole box is made from one solid piece, and in this case, it snapped. But you can see the saw marks. You know, there's a large circular saw cutting through, you know, extremely hard stone. But you know, they make mistakes. It's one of those things. Yeah. Yes, they do. Let me just uh, click. There's this. an awful lot of stuff in that museum, and it's pretty amazing. Got to say. Indeed. Indeed it is. Yeah, there's, we, we've got a, actually a nice marks. video on our site as well about the uh, about the um, about the uh, statues in the museum, which technically you yeah. can see have precision surfaces and were, well, frankly, defaced by some of the writings that were on them. But um, that's another video. Check it out. It's Hieroglyphic channel. graffiti. Yeah. Yep, and you'll find a lot of you know there's a lot of stuff that was found under Zoser's pyramid. That uh, you got bowls and jars made out of brescia and imperial porphyr and right. uh, in some cases corundum all of those stones are extremely hard you can't you know we would cut those with diamond today yeah. uh, and these are all perfectly shaped the interior spaces are hollowed out like through the neck um, there's really small holes cut in them it's, it's precision work done in incredibly hard stone Indeed. that's at least four and a half thousand years old it's attributed to pre-dynastic uh, you know Nakata culture yeah it how does that work one of my favorite things, and in fact, I'll post this on Instagram. So follow us on Instagram. We've been really busy posting some of this stuff, particularly Abu Sir. I've been making an example of all the tool marks on Abu Sir on Instagram lately. But one of the, my favorite things that you've reminded me of in the, in the museum is exactly this. It's a pre-dynastic object, supposedly before uh, even the Old Kingdom came, but it's, it's a lapis lazuli sheath. It's yes. a small tube of like it's a hollowed out stone tube of a very difficult to work and, and semi-precious stone it's hard and it's it, it shatters easily but it's a hollow tube it's about this long and it has a gold sheath on the end of it and it's just and it's sitting there amongst like stone like pottery and clay crap and it's it's really bizarre you go if you if you understand like the difficulty in using and then particularly the inside spaces of these bowls and jars and things 
they lined up in the same space as this pottery and other crap. <laughs> this, this ain't the same picture. It's, you know, they all attribute it to some of that to pre-dynastic. I would love to see somebody use those technologies trying to recreate one of those bowls because you ain't good. We're inheritors. We do inherit everything. That's right. I think we've got some amnesia from a small ding that the planet took about 13,000 years ago. So. Cool. Well, we hope you enjoyed it. That's uh, podcast number three. We will be doing these a bit more regularly, I hope. We've got a nice new setup. But uh, if you liked it, please share it. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. Help us spread the word. Um, any feedback is appreciated. Get at us on pickerj.com or any other methods that are on the screen now. Have a great uh, St. Paddy's Day weekend. Yeah, indeed. Take it easy, everyone. We'll see you again. Drive fast, swerve a lot. Indeed. <laughs> do some of that right now.